Hello, and welcome to the Dissident Mama podcast. Today, my guest is Earl Starbuck, a native of East Tennessee. Starbuck is an independent historian and a descendant of the soldiers on both sides of the late unpleasantness and of Governor John Sevier. His father, who was a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, taught him to love history and the South. Starbuck holds a BA in history and political science from Carson Newman University and an MA in history from Liberty University. He has no connection to the coffee company. Welcome, Earl. How are you? Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm plugging away. I'm plugging away. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well. I'm glad to have you on. We're going to talk about... Nice. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, a couple of things. Well, first of all, it is fun to actually, you know, see you and talk with you because we've been online friends for quite a long time. And I always like it when that happens. Yeah, it's well, nice to meet you. We're going to talk about um, some of your writing and a petition you have going and just kind of um, some of your takeaways of uh, what's happening in our insane world. But before we get started, um, some of our listeners might not know what is the late unpleasantness? What is that? Well, the, the late unpleasantness between the states is this uh, little event you might have heard of that occurred from 1861 to 1865, thereabouts, um, where about a million men killed each other over uh, whether or not a state could leave the Union. Okay. So uh, today, most people would probably call that the Civil War. Um, my eighth grade economics teacher referred to it as the War of Northern Aggression. Nice. So there's, there's that. Brian McClanahan... <laughs> Uh, accurately refers to it as uh, the War for Southern Independence. Okay. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was the, the people who came soon thereafter who were living during the war or maybe had heard stories about it from um, maybe parents or grandparents refer to it as that just because it seemed like a, uh, a very undramatic way to describe something very dramatic, which is kind of a interesting well, the, Southern trait. <laughs> the, the South, the South is... You know, I've, I've got family and, and cousins and aunts and uncles who love the Britcoms, um, the British comedies, because of the dry humor. Yeah. And the South, for whatever reason, loves the dry humor. And that's uh, that's a characteristic that goes back to the war. I think if, if you go back and read any any anecdotes from the war, the soldiers are always putting on a lot of very dry humor or gallows humor. Um, there's one incident I remember, I think it was the Battle of the Wilderness, where the Confederate line breaks, and this soldier is running away, and he's keeping up with a lieutenant on horseback, and they're both just running away as fast as they can, and they get a safe distance away, and the line starts to reform, and the, uh, the soldier, the private soldier, looks up at the lieutenant and says, well, uh, you know, how, how are we going? How are things going, General? And, and the lieutenant lifts his hat and says, we're driving them handsomely, sir, driving them handsomely. <laughs> Um, so I remember reading one account, the, uh, the soldiers, uh, in Lee's army entrenched around Richmond and Petersburg during the siege of those cities. Um, the soldiers, uh, decided to refer to themselves as Lee's miserables because Vic Victor Hugo's Les Miserables had just been printed. And, uh, they, they thought that was funny. One, one soldier at the time said he was, uh, great. His stomach was grateful that it had a backbone to cling to. It was so empty. <laughs> so they, they, they had their love of dry humor. So right. referring to the bloodiest war ever fought on the North American continent as the late unpleasantness, right. it, it's, it is a very, very dry sort of gallows humor. I would, I would say. Yeah, just classic. And if you don't get it, or if you think that the people saying it don't get it, get it, I guess you think they're just really um, uh, unintelligent. <laughs> right. Which, well, there's it, it is a way of uh, perhaps identifying kindred spirits. Yes, we could we could say that. And uh, tell me a little bit about Governor John Sevier. All I know is other than him being the governor at some point in time, I've heard of Sevierville. Um, my husband had an uncle who lived there, but uh, who was this Governor Sevier? He was a pretty important guy. He was the first uh, first governor of the state of Tennessee, helped settle that uh, state when it was a territory. And uh, I don't know that much more about him. I really should research more into him. Uh, I found out about him because I was doing some research into family genealogy, and it turns out that on my mother's side, we are descended from the Severe family, and the Severe family is actually descended from the brother of St. Xavier of Spain. Uh, Severe is the Anglicization of uh, Xavier. 
So that's, that's that's a that's a cool little connection. I didn't think I had any Spanish blood in me. I always thought I was go. completely Celtic. So <laughs> maybe that explains my temper. I right. have a Latin temper. <laughs> you're you're feisty on both fronts, I guess. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well, you know, the Irish, the Spanish, the, the you know, they're they're all all a bunch of brawlers. All right. So I want to dive <laughs> into first this um, new. Uh, what am I trying to say? A petition. It's on I petitions. Dot com and it's called Tennessee must oppose vaccine tyranny. Yes. Uh, tell us the uh, motivation for this. Well, I'm sure you saw that just a couple of days ago, resident Biden issued a new mandate uh, requiring all businesses that employ a hundred people or more to uh, make their employees either get the COVID vaccine or be tested weekly. And I know you have some issues with the vaccine. Um, I have a few questions myself about the vaccine, but let's put those aside for a second and just assume for the sake of argument that the COVID vaccines are the purest universal panacea known to mankind. Okay, it's the, it, is the, it is the remedy to cure all ills. It is just the best thing since sliced bread. The government still doesn't have the right to make you take that against your will. Um, so this petition is asking the state governor uh, in Tennessee, that's Bill Lee, to call together a special session of the Tennessee General Assembly so that the General Assembly can nullify Biden's mandate. This is entirely unconstitutional. Um, the federal government doesn't have the right to make your medical decisions for you. It doesn't have the right to tell your employer to make your medical decisions for you. Um, when a government tells businesses to carry out the policies of the government um, to, to perform its will to become, when, it, when a government tries to make private businesses the agents of the state that operate to perform the will of the state, to enact the policies of the state for the benefit of the state, there is a word for that. It's called fascism. Um, and we're, we're not very big fans of that here in America. At least I didn't think we were. Because right. for four years, for four years, I had, you know, the media, everybody was saying, hey, the president's a fascist. We, we got to oppose this guy. Fascism, 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 literally Hitler. Uh, but now that you have a uh, resident in the White House who enacts literal textbook fascism, uh, large segments of the population have no problem with that. Uh, seemingly have no problem with that. Uh, or, and, and if they do, the media is not going to admit that they do. But we have anti-fascists running around keeping us all safe. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, through, through, through well, see, the anti-fascists are keeping us safe through violence and political uh, political violence and intimidation, right. <laughs> which is what fascists do. Right. Right. I, I think it was uh, I think it was uh, Winston Churchill who said uh, the fascists of the future will call themselves anti-fascist. Um, so there, there you go. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I never thought it was that good, but I, I need the stogie. I, I need the cigar and the bow tie yes. to really be able to sell it. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about nullification as a, a power that, that states have, that people have. They can do it, you know, on a, on a court if they're, you know, on a jury. Um, uh, something that Jefferson was uh, a fan of. In fact, uh, you wrote an article for uh, me that I guess posted Roe v. Wade, a mere nullity. Am I saying it right? Nullity. Nullity. Yeah. Nullity. Um, so uh, it's basically talking about how nullification could serve to um, promote the pro-life cause. So give us a, tell us how, null, what nullification is in your opinion and how a state this thing that's not right. people supposedly could just say, hey, we're not going to do that. Well, OK, to begin with, uh, I chose the I chose the title Roe v. Wade is a mere nullity mm -hmm. because of a quotation from St. George Tucker. And St. George Tucker was a big friend of Thomas Jefferson. He was a jurist and uh, judge in Virginia. In 1803, he published uh, annotated commentaries on Blackstone's commentaries on the English common law. And for a long time, St. George Tucker's annotated commentaries were the basic law book for large segments of the country. Uh, so this guy knew what he was talking about. And 
Tucker said that any law that Congress passes that is not constitutional is a mere nullity, right? Jefferson, mm -hmm. in the uh, Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, Jefferson reminds everybody that the states, when they ratified the Constitution, uh, did not make the federal government the exclusive or final judge of its own powers, and that any law that the federal government passes that is not constitutional is null, void, and of no force. Now, the laws that Jefferson was responding to then were very uh, evidently not constitutional because they directly contradicted the First Amendment. Um, well, the Sedition Act did. The Alien Acts are a little more dicey. Uh, although I think Jefferson probably had the right in that as well, because he's a lot smarter than, you know, 99% of the people walking around today, and certainly smarter than 99% of the people in government today. So the idea of nullification goes back to, uh, well, depending on who you ask, it has Protestant roots. There's a good book, good little pamphlet sized book on this, um, called The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates by Matthew J. Trewella. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. He, he thinks the federal government is superior to the states. There, there are some issues there. He sees the states as lesser magistrates. They're not. They made the federal government, and the federal government is accountable to them. That's why they amend the Constitution, right? Article 5, uh, the states amend the Constitution. And if the states can amend the Constitution, they have to be able to interpret the Constitution. So contrary to John Marshall, contrary to the Supreme Court saying that the states can't interpret the Constitution, the states have to. They have to. If they're, if they're going to determine whether or not they need to change it through the amendment process, they have to be able to interpret it. Um, so in, in his book, Truella points out that uh, the doctrine of the lesser magistrates is a biblical idea. It's the idea that you have to obey God rather than men, that God, is inst that God has instituted government, and that because God has instituted government, he has ordained it, there are certain limits on the powers of government um, resulting from God's ordination. Right? There are limits past which the government cannot go. So when the Holy Roman Emperor came in and tried to re-Catholicize the Protestant city-states of the Holy Roman Empire, Magdeburg st stood up and said no. And because it had the, the tallest walls in Germany at the time, it was the most heavily fortified city in Germany, it, it won. They won the siege. It, it was a several months long siege. I think it was almost a year. But eventually the Holy Roman Emperor gave up and said, all right, fine, you can have your Protestantism. You can keep it. And they, they, uh, that was the foundation of that. So the idea of nullification has Christian roots. It, it is rooted in the idea that government is instituted by God and has hard limits past which it cannot go. So fast forward to the colonies. What does this have to do with the United States? Well, in 1765, the uh, British colonies in North America nullified the Stamp Act because the Stamp Act violated the British Constitution. Um, the, the, the rub of the argument, and if you really want to understand the American position in detail, you can go back and read Thomas Jefferson's uh, summary view of the rights of British America, where he lays out the arguments in great detail and great length. Uh, but basically, the idea is that the British Parliament through the Stamp Act was taxing the people of the colonies without their consent because the people of the colonies had no representation in parliament. Um, so that, that was the rallying cry behind the Boston Tea Party, no taxation without representation. And the problem with that was that the states or the colonies had their own legislatures. They had no representation in parliament. So their legislatures, their general assemblies or what have you, could levy taxes within, Virginia could levy taxes within herself because Virginia's people elected the members of the legislature. Um, but they had no representation in parliament. And the British constitution going back to the Magna Carta was very clear on this. In order for the, the government to be able to levy taxes, it had to have the consent of the governed and it could not have the consent of the governed without the governed granting their consent through a representative body. In that case, it was parliament. But the, the colonists were insisting that because they had no representation in Parliament, Parliament had no right to tax them internally. Now, uh, regulation of commerce with other countries, uh, external commerce, import-export trade, that Parliament could regulate. But that was a whole different that was a whole different uh, issue, whole different ball of wax. So, nullification 
by the states has to do with the fact that uh, J- James Madison pointed this out multiple times. There are three things you can mean when you say state, right? You could be referring to the geographic area on a map. You could be referring to the state government, like the governor or the legislature, or you could be referring to the people, the sovereign political community that is a state. The state of Great Britain is a sovereign political community. That's why Jefferson drew a parallel, a comparison between the state of Great Britain or the United Kingdom and the states that were declaring independence in 1776. They are as independent as Great Britain is because they are also sovereign political communities. So when sovereign political communities enter into treaties or agreements of their own free will, they can leave of their own free will. And if the rules are being broken by the governing body, they can say, hey, you're not allowed to do that. Um, Great Britain just left the EU. Or, you know, at least supposedly, right? They had the referendum. Uh, actually getting out has been a little more difficult. But nobody, nobody called that revolutionary. Nobody called that, uh, you know, treasonous. They joined of their own free will. They left of their own free will. And I, I like to think of it, it's, it's like a sports team or sending your kid to school, right? You're, you're, the, you're the parent, you send your kid off and the coach has a certain job, right? Let's say you're sending your kid off to learn how to play volleyball right? Well, the coach has a responsibility to teach your kid how to play volleyball. Uh, you know, here's the rules here. Here's, you need to learn about sportsmanship. Uh, you got to do your drills. You got to, you know, run up and down the field, back and forth, run backwards, do your push-ups, all that good stuff. But if the coach starts telling your kid, Hey, uh, let me sit you down and give you some religious instruction. Hey, let me sit you down and tell you what your diet has to be. Hey, I've written out this, uh, this schedule for you that you have to follow to the letter, you know, here's your sleeping habits and your study habits. Take this home and give this to your dad. But you're obviously not going to go along with that. You didn't agree to that. And the coach doesn't get to tell you what your parental rights are. You have delegated certain authority to that coach over your kid because that coach is teaching your kid how to play a sport. But you haven't abdicated your position as a parent and you haven't uh, abandoned your responsibilities as a parent. So in delegating certain authority to the coach, you didn't give up all the authority you kept. And the enemies of nullification, and this, this goes back a long way. This goes back to John Jay. This goes back to John Marshall, some of the earliest Supreme Court justices, insisting that the states gave up their sovereignty when they ratified the Constitution. But that, that's, that's, that's a sophistry. That's ridiculous. It's insane. It would be like saying that you gave up all your parental rights because you delegated certain authority to your kid's volleyball coach or soccer coach or football coach or school teacher, right? If you send your kid to school and you think the teacher is going to be teaching your kid reading, writing, and arithmetic, and lo and behold, the teacher is teaching your kid critical race theory, you've got a problem and you've got every right to pull your kid out of that school because your kid doesn't belong to that teacher. Your kid belongs to you. Um, so when, when you have people like John Marshall or Joseph Story coming along and insisting that the states gave up their sovereignty when they ratified the Constitution, you have to understand that that's a lie developed by people who wanted the federal government to have complete power over every aspect of government um, and every aspect of life. But if you read the Tenth Amendment, the Tenth Amendment's clear. All powers not delegated are reserved to the states. Now, Madison made this weird argument in one of the Federalist papers where he said that there's this dual sovereignty between the states and the federal government. That's, that's Madison trying to, trying to have his cake and eat it too because he walked into the Philadelphia Convention with a nationalist plan and he really wanted to keep this nationalist idea going. Um, but there's, there's no such thing as dual sovereignty. You can't have that. The states are sovereign because they are the individual political communities that make up the union. The federal government represents them. And, and the federal government's purpose is basically to represent the states as one body to outsiders. It handles external trade. It handles defense. It establishes a free trade zone so you don't have the states laying tariffs on each other and declaring war on each other. But that's it. All domestic institutions are left to the states to regulate. So that's, that's why Roe v. Wade is a mere nullity. The Constitution says nothing about abortion. That is a domestic institution that is reserved to the states. Um, and the, the, the big problem with this 
is that you have people insisting that the federal government has to be able to do X, Y, or Z because of the Bill of Rights. But the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to the states. The founding fathers were very clear that it didn't apply to the states. And this is why you have to go back to the state ratification conventions. You have to look at the arguments they themselves made about the, uh, about the union, about the constitution, about how it was going to function. Uh, James Madison himself, when the Bill of Rights was proposed, James Madison actually proposed an amendment to the Constitution to make the Bill of Rights apply to the states. It was voted down. Uh, John Marshall, Baron v. Baltimore, 1833, the one Supreme Court case John Marshall got right, he admitted that the Bill of Rights didn't apply to the states. Even after the passage of the 14th Amendment, the uh, Congress proposed an amendment to the Constitution to make the First Amendment apply to the states, and it was voted down. So if the 14th Amendment made the Bill of Rights apply to the states through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which is what the Supreme Court declares now, right? That's the incorporation doctrine. Um, the Bill of Rights applies to the states because the 14th Amendment requires due process. If that's the case, then why did Congress, that, that same Congress that had, passed the four, that had proposed the 14th Amendment and sent it off to the states for ratification just a few years before, why did that same Republican-controlled Congress try to amend the Constitution again to make the First Amendment apply to the state? None of it makes any sense. So nullification in an American context involves the state governments acting as representatives of the people. And that's why this, that's what this petition is about. The petition asks the governor to call a, sp a special session of the state legislature, and then it asks the legislature to pass uh, certain laws that would prevent the federal government from violating the constitution and violating the rights and liberties of the people. So the people are asking the government to act on behalf of the people. That's what representative government is. So it's not just that the state government, it's, it's not like you have the state governments running around and they can do whatever they want, regardless of what the people of the states want. Nullification has to do with when the federal government is riding roughshod over the people, the people have a means of stopping it. So uh, the petition itself asks the state legislature to do a couple of things. One, to completely prohibit all vaccine mandates and vaccine passports, to nullify all federal vaccine mandates and vaccine passports, to keep businesses from requiring vaccine mandates and passports. Um, and, and the problem there is people are going to go, oh, private company, private company, they can do what they want. There's no way to tell whether or not they're being told to do that by the feds behind closed doors. You could have the CDC threatening companies. You could have the CDC offering subsidies to companies. Hey, you, you get all this money. We'll give you X, Y, or Z. We don't know. And, and when you're dealing with a fascistic presidential administration that is willing to do that, there's no way to know. There's no transparency here. Joe Biden's not going to tell people the truth. Jim Psaki is not going to tell people the truth. Uh, and it also, the petition also asks the legislature to make it clear, uh, number one, require businesses not to pay the fines. Number two, make it clear that businesses that don't pay the fines will be protected by the state government. Now, the, the problem with attempting to nullify this, see, back in the day, the federal government didn't operate directly on individuals but it does now. So the federal government is going to try and fine these businesses $14,000 for each employee that it doesn't force to get vaccinated. Each infraction of the mandate is a $14,000 fine. Um, back in the 1780s, that would have meant sending a tax collector down to the business to actually take their money. Nowadays, all they have to do is have OSHA or the IRS go to the business or to the business's bank Right. And this is this is why the founding fathers, this is why Thomas Jefferson hated the idea of central banking, because if the banks are in bed with the government, the government can take your money away whenever it likes. So uh, the petition specifically asks that the, the state government require the businesses not to pay the fines and then make it clear that any bank or credit union that pays the money to the federal government will be fined by the state. However much, however much money it steals from the business and gives to the federal government, it is going to be fined by the state government. And however much money it steals, it has to pay back. Um, and it also makes clear that the state should pass a law saying that, hey, 
these businesses are not going to be paying this fine. And not only that, if you try to make them pay this fine, the state police are going to arrest you. So if, if federal law enforcement comes into the state of Tennessee and tries to make people do this, we will arrest them. We will fine them $10 million and deport them from the state. $10 million is a big number. Hopefully it will deter uh, tyranny. And uh, the, the, there's another part of the petition that asks the state government to uh, protect the state treasury. Because one, one of my other concerns is where, where are our tax dollars in, in Tennessee? I don't know which bank they're kept in. So if that bank caves to the federal government and the federal government says, well, see, we, we took your treasury away. Now we'll give it back if you get in line. We've got to prevent that from happening too. Um, and it's got to be made clear this is not about wealth redistribution, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to do that at all. But if you have a bank stealing a business's money, it, it has to pay that money back. Right. And if, if, the, if the bank is complying with an unconstitutional federal mandate, it is absolutely stealing that business's money. They, they have no right to do that. So how is the petition doing? And do you think it will make its way to Lee's desks or his handlers? Or what's your plan with that? Well, so far, and I, I want to encourage any of your viewers that live in Tennessee, please sign the petition and please go to the uh, Tennessee government website, because I, I have been discussing this with a, with a couple of people who are in the know, and I, I don't want to name them, but according to the people I have been talking to, the House is willing to have a special session, but the Senate is not. So apparently there are some conservatives in name only in the Senate who are attempting to obstruct the special session. They're, they're objecting to it. So if you're in Tennessee, sign the petition, please share it, email it to people. Right now we only have 19 signatures. I've been doing everything I can think of to try and get the news out there. Um, I'm trying to scrape together enough money to pay to feature it on the homepage so that anybody that goes to iPetitions, it'll be one of the first things they see on the homepage there. But uh, if you live in Tennessee, please go to, and I wrote this down so I didn't mess it up, uh, capital.tn.gov slash Senate slash members. And if you go to that page, there's a list of senators, which party they're a member of, their district, their office number, uh, the list, a list of bills that they've sponsored or voted for, their office phone number, and their email. Now, if you're looking at that page and you, you see the senator's name, they're in alphabetical order. The email icon is going to be right next. To, it's going to be to the left of the, the name um, of that senator. So uh, find out which district you're in. Get your voter registration card. Call them. Make their phones ring off the hook. Email them. Fill up their inboxes. Make it clear. You want this special session called. You want these laws passed because you don't want the federal government violating your rights. And if you've had the vaccine, okay, fine. That's your decision. Do you want the federal government to be able to tell your neighbors that they have to get it? Do you want the federal government to six months from now declare that you have to inject something else? Let's say there's a new, new illness. There's a new vaccine. Do you want the federal government making your medical decisions for you? Uh, what, what, if, what if Joe Biden comes out and says, well, you know, all these states that have been passing pro-life laws, this is a violation of women's bodily autonomy. Every man has to get a vasectomy now. I mean, this is this is where we're headed. The, the federal government is going to be making everybody's uh, medical decisions for them. I mean, if they can make you get a vaccine, they can make you get a hysterectomy or a vasectomy or something else. And and you you could argue that uh, a vaccine is just a well, it's just an injection. It's not the same thing as a major surgery. What well, it kind of is though, because it permanently changes your body, mm -hmm. right? That's that's the nature of a vaccine. It permanently alters your body, whether it's and, and again, this is not about what's in the COVID vaccine. Any vaccine permanently alters your body in some way. So you've got to know what's in it, number one. But those decisions are your decisions to make, not somebody else's. So this, this is a matter of bodily autonomy. And I hear an awful lot of people. I, I went to college with a fellow who's a friend of mine on Facebook, went into the ministry and he just posted on Facebook and said, well, you know, I want to love my neighbor. And if giving up a little liberty for the safety of the community 
uh, well, that's that's loving my neighbor. So I'm going to keep wearing my mask and please get your vaccine. And I'm sitting there reading that thinking, wait, wait a minute, doesn't loving your neighbor mean protecting your neighbor's bodily autonomy? Doesn't loving your neighbor mean standing up to a totalitarian regime that wants to control every aspect of your neighbor's life? Um, and I, all, I, I commented on there and said, hey, I just want to remind you of something. You remember the French reign of terror where they killed tens of thousands of people? by sending them off to be kissed by Mademoiselle Le Guillotine, just, just beheading people, beheading children because they were aristocrats. Uh, that, was, that was instituted by the Committee of Public Safety. Okay, so when the government violates your rights for your own good, it's never for your own good. Right. And when the government, if, if, if the government can break the law because there's an emergency, it will manufacture more emergencies so that it can keep breaking the law. So what's, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Okay, so, you know, we live in, a, in an era of law and order, seems to be um, diminishing, if not all, all out dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the constitution, eh, you know, sometimes people follow it. Sometimes they don't, you know, it's this pliable living, breathing document and all these kinds of things. Yeah. It's got, what, it's got two legs and runs around too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, you know, uh, changing meaning de depending on, you know, who you're talking to. Yeah. How, how do you think the the state is, is going to deal with, you said a totalitarian regime like Washington, DC, you know, uh, this could, you know, cause some trouble you know it, it's as if uh the state is telling the federal government they can stick it and i think that's been done before so uh you know how would you you know advise the, the people of tennessee or you know your elected officials or your governor to you know stand up to this because they could always they as in the federal government could withhold yeah. you know your transportation money or your education money, which is what they did to North Carolina with the North Carolina, you know, bathroom bill and all that kind of thing. You know, they, they, um, they hold, they dangle that carrot, you know, your money that siphons through yeah. to Washington, DC, you know, extortion tactics, right. You know, nobody wants to deal with that. So how they'll, they'll gonna... make us an offer we can't refuse. Right. right. I mean, it's important, but how are you going to talk, you know, career politicians into doing this simply because they have families too? Well, the career politicians need to understand, con okay, Congress and uh, the staffers that work for Congress are exempt from the vaccine mandate, right? Mm -hmm. State legislators aren't, their wives aren't, their kids aren't, their employees aren't. So Joe Biden's exempt, Congress is exempt, the, you know, the, the big people, they're exempt, the elite, they're exempt, but us payons, us little folks down here, we're not exempt. So number one, uh, yeah, making money and, and having enough money to live on is a big deal. Making sure that your children still have bodily autonomy and control over their medical decisions, that's also a big deal. Yeah. Um, when it comes to getting money from the feds, I mean, then all, that is all unconstitutional anyway. The Department of Education, Transportation, and I don't, I don't want to get off into the whole thing on the welfare system, but, and I understand, I understand that there are people who are dependent on, on Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. I understand that people have been forced to pay into that for decades. I have an uncle who's going to be 65 soon. He's going to be uh, applying for Social Security. And he's like, look, I, I don't want to get it. I know it's a Ponzi scheme. I know it's socialism. I know the money's not even there. They're going to be taking it out of your tax dollars. But they took it from me by force for all these for my whole life. And I have no retirement. So I understand that that's a, a big, uh, big concern. It's a very legitimate concern. Um, and I think the answer is to, in the words of Brian McClanahan, think locally and act locally. So if, if the feds come down and say, well, you're going to obey this vaccine mandate or we'll take all your benefits away, you say, OK, stick it. Um, be charitable to your neighbors. Be charitable to your family. Help your neighbors. Help your family. This is what mediating institutions are for. This is what churches and charities and families are for, so that you aren't dependent on the government. Dependence begets, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, dependence begets subservience and venality, right? If, if you are dependent 
on the federal government, you will obey the federal government. And they know that. That's why they pushed the welfare state. That was LBJ was very open about this. That was why he pushed the Great Society and the War on Poverty. He wanted to make the black community dependent on the federal government and specifically the Democrat Party. And he succeeded, right? And in so doing, he, he destroyed the black family. 75% of black children uh, born today are born out of wedlock. 25% of white children born today are born out of wedlock. It's almost as if incentivizing women to marry Uncle Sam destroy the family. Gee, imagine that. Um, I mean, practically speaking, there are a lot of issues with that, certainly. Um, the, the feds could say, hey, no more Medicaid, hey, no more Medicare, hey, just no money at all. We'd have to get by on our own. And yeah, that would, that would mean tightening our belts. That would mean uh, living less high on the hog. And for people that are already having trouble making ends meet, I, I understand that that's a problem. But Tennessee was not one of those states that shut down, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they, they had, you know, there's a little like lockdown recommendation or something in May it, it, of 2020, but it wasn't like you had them shutting down businesses and all this other nonsense. You had some places that shut down voluntarily. Uh, I think we got hurt uh, worse by the eviction moratorium than by the um, sh uh, shutdown, the government shutdowns, mm -hmm. because... Um, the eviction moratorium hurt, you know, small businesses. It hurt small renters. Uh, they didn't get bailed out. The big multi, you know, multinational conglomerates, the big corporations, they got billions of dollars of bailouts from the federal government. So small renters were already having difficulty making ends meet, and they couldn't evict people. I, 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 uh, I heard one story about a guy who is still paying the mortgage on this house, right? He's renting out his own house to try and make ends meet still paying the mortgage on it. The eviction moratorium comes down and his renters refuse to pay. So he's, he's living with his parents so he can rent out his own house. Uh, he's selling off his own possessions to try and make ends meet. He is still contractually required to fulfill all of his, his responsibilities as a landlord, but he can't kick them out for refusing to pay their rent for month after month after month. And they, they were still working. They, they got all the stimulus checks. They bought two brand new cars but they wouldn't pay their rent. Meanwhile, this guy is trying to figure out how to feed his kids. And I understand that there could also have been some situations where, you know, people couldn't have paid their rent, but that, that kind of mentality, Hey, your property doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the government. Right. That same Marxist mentality. It's coming down here. Hey, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the government. So yeah, people, there, there could be some financial repercussions to this, but you know what? I, I, I'm willing to bet that if the federal government, if Tennessee stands up and says, hey, you're not doing this to our people, number one, we're not the only state uh, looking at standing up against this. There's something like 19 governors and two states attorney general that have already stood up and said they're not going to allow this. Now, whether or not they're going to go as far as I want them to or as this petition is asking them to, uh, whether or not they're going to go as far as I think constitutionally they should or as far as their duty requires them to, that's, that's debatable. But let's say for a minute that Tennessee, this, this petition passes, the legislature gets called, and they pass all these resolutions. And then the feds come down on us and say, no more Medicare. Medi there are charities out there. And I, I guarantee you that if that happens, like the Daily Wire, I, I, I know we have our issues with the Daily Wire, you and me, but they're headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee, and they have made it clear that they're not going. Jeremy Boring came out and said, we're not going to comply with this mandate. And they have a lot of clout. So if Tennessee nullifies this and the feds retaliate by denying grandmas their social security checks, number one, that's going to be a huge PR disaster. I can't even begin to imagine how much of a PR disaster that's going to be. You want grandma to starve? You want to keep little Johnny from, from getting his Medicaid treatment. I mean, that's, they're, they're going to be able to hammer the federal government on that for, for months if they want to. Joe Biden's going to take it on the chin for that. But if, if they come down on us, the Daily Wire can go out there and say, hey, folks, uh, raise some money. We're starting a charity. We're starting a, we're starting a GoFundMe to help people who aren't going to be getting their Social Security checks. We're going to be starting a GoFundMe or Kickstarter or, you know, whatever. However you raise money in, in the digital age, 
donate Bitcoin, whatever it is. Right. So there are going to be ways that we can circumvent. If, if the government comes in and takes, takes away the welfare benefits, uh, there, there are going to be ways that we can get around that. I don't think that the, the American people are going to side with the feds on this at and all. And it's forcing people, and I think uh, people, including myself, because we've all gotten soft, we need to be forced to, to uh, do these things sometimes because the battle's always been the same, right? Centralization versus decentralization. Regionalism or localism versus the empire. Um, yeah, exactly. Live and let live versus puritanical progressivism. Self-determination versus the meddling Yankee Karens. This is why the segue to the late unpleasantness that if you get the war between the states wrong, I just don't understand how you can understand today. And that's always what I'm trying to explain to people. And this is one of the right. reasons the Daily Wire sometimes gets on my nerves because you have Lincolnians working there who talk about- Or Stephen, Stephen Crowder. Right, who talk about, oh, you know, uh, whatever, the South were traitors, you know, slavery, blah, blah, blah. But it's the same exact battle as it was right. in 1861, you know, it goes back before that, you know, you were talking about, you know, Chief Justice John Marshall, you know, he, he was the first oh, Chief yeah. Justice of the Supreme Court, if I'm not wrong. I mean, it goes back to that. And of course, you have the secession of the colonists from Great Britain. It's always that story. So this is why the war is so important. And, um, you know, what, what do you do with people where they're like on the same page with you, but then they just don't, they can't connect that dot because they don't want to be called names or they've just been too miseducated. I know there are some people you've been battling with on social media, but how do you explain to people <coughs> that states' rights are okay and it doesn't make you a neo-Confederate? And guess what? If you want to be a neo-Confederate, that's awesome too, or just call yourself a Confederate. Like for people to stop worrying about um, being maligned, you know, thrown under the bus with the, the horrible Southern man. A, you should stand up for him and us and B, you are him. You know, right. even if you live in Idaho, if you're opposed to federal government doing something to you like this, you're a neo-Confederate. So just get yeah, used to in it. The, in their <laughs> eyes, yeah. Uh, well, and I mean, based on your t-shirt, I never would have guessed you were, uh, you know, uh, interested in, in, the South, yeah, or Orthodox. <laughs> I, I never would have guessed you were an, an Orthodox Confederate. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been having those arguments with people. It seems like a lot more lately. There's a girl that was, uh, I say girl, young woman, who was a, uh, a classmate of mine in grad school. And she posted something on her Facebook about you know, all Christians coming to these, you know, making these full-throated defense of Confederate monuments, and how can you, and aren't you glad that the side that defended slavery lost, and da-da-da-da. And I said, look, the South wasn't fighting for slavery, and then I give, you know, Abbeville Institute links, and historians, and sources, and all this stuff, and she said, well, you should be giving primary sources, not the Abbeville Institute. So then I, and she, then she quotes the Confederate Constitution. Well, then I go and look at the Confederate Constitution, I pull up the same uh, section she's referencing and say, hey, you're leaving out X, Y, and Z. You're leaving out the fact that the 10th Amendment, what we would call the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, was part, I think it was uh, Article 6, Section 6 of the Confederate Constitution, right? So states', states rights were part of that. So she's reading this and saying, well, slavery was protected in perpetuity forever, and it would still exist if the South had won. And I'm going, wait, 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 no, 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 it wasn't protected forever. Well, uh, you know, banning slavery was illegal only for Congress. Well, no, because the states, the states couldn't ban it because of this section over here. Well, that section over here just means that if Virginia bans it and South Carolina doesn't, and you visit Virginia from South Carolina and take your slave with you, your slave isn't free just because he entered Virginia. And, and these provisions, as, as awful as these sound, I mean, I, this is horrible to our ears, right? I mean, nobody likes slavery. One of the biggest problems in the U.S. today is sex trafficking, sex slavery. We have a $2 billion sex trafficking in, in, industry. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about the fact that globally there's more slaves to, uh, today, right now, than ever in the history of the, the world, at least that we're aware of. Um, but these provisions that she's quoting, number one, she's completely misunderstanding them, misinterpreting them. She's applying them or reading them as if uh, the federal judiciary was going to come in and say, now, states, you have to do what the federal government says. That's not how the South operated. 
number she one. She was thinking under a um, Lincolnian paradigm. Exactly. And num number two, these, these sections that she was quoting were passed in order to head off problems that had arisen under the origin under the U.S. Constitution. So uh, somebody traveling from one state to another with his slave and then the slave saying, well, I lived in a free state. I'm free now. That was the basis of Dred Scott's suit in the Dred Scott rule in, in Dred Scott v. Sanford, the, one of the most infamous Supreme Court cases ever. They were trying to head problems like that off at the pass. Um, she was quoting some other section and, and they, they were basically heading off the Missouri Compromise issue. It had to do with the territories. Slavery is protected in the territories. And she's saying, see, they were protecting slavery in perpetuity. No, they were saying that, have, that a state's domestic institutions are not a basis for denying that state entry into and ownership of the common property of the states because the states are co-equal partners, right? And that's ugly and that's awful when we think about slavery, right? But let's back up for a minute and say, okay, but that principle of the states being co-equal partners in the union, that applies to any issue. So if, for example, the Supreme Court hadn't made gay marriage the law of the land. And you had some states that banned gay marriage and some states that recognized gay marriage. Those states are all co-equal partners in the union, regardless of their stance on that particular domestic issue within the state. Mm -hmm. The same is true of abortion, right? How much worse is abortion? How much worse is child murder than slavery, right? There's, there's, no, there's no moral comparison between Jefferson Davis and Planned Parenthood. Jefferson Davis didn't dismember children and sell their corpses. So, and, and I know people are going to go, oh, you're defending slavery. No, I'm not. I'm well, saying that there's, a, I'm saying that there's a hierarchy a of, there's a, there's a hierarchy <laughs> of evil, right? There's a hierarchy of evil and dismembering children and selling their corpses right. is worse than owning slaves. And, and let's, let's, let's be really clear about this. What do we mean by slavery? Do we mean in law or do we mean in fact? Because there's an awful lot of young black men in prison right now that are being used for slave labor because they were carrying around some weed. Okay, that's how Kamala Harris uh, kept her position as state district attorney in California. She pushed for people, nonviolent drug offenders, to get worse sentences than they should have gotten so that the private prison system could use them as slave labor. Kanye, yeah. West, Kanye West has pointed that out. So, uh, and, and numerous other people. And I'm not saying all these leftists that are going, oh, you know, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. But if, if we're going to be really honest about this, debt, the book of Proverbs says that the borrower is the slave, the lender, right? If I owe capital one 10 grand, then I'm working a certain portion of my work day every day. I'm, I'm expending my time, my labor, my energy to pay back that debt. They own a portion of my labor. Now, I know that people are going to go back and forth, indentured servitude versus chattel, this whole big debate. The bottom line is this. Jefferson Davis didn't dismember children and sell their corpses. <laughs> Planned Parenthood does. Jefferson Davis is noted among historians for treating his slaves well. He established a court uh, among the slaves themselves, once a month, the slaves could come and deal with their own issues. And the only time he ever interfered with that was when he thought the slave jury was punishing the accused too harshly. He only ever interfered to commute sentences. Jefferson, uh, his wife, um, it was 1864, his wife was out and about shopping one day and runs across this, this little orphan boy, black orphan boy, Jim Limbert. And they adopt this kid. They take this kid into their home. They raise him like their son. And later during the escape from Richmond, uh, Union troops catch her and uh, Mrs. Davis. They catch the kids and they take Jim Limber away. And she spent, she spent years trying to find that kid. We don't know what happened to that little boy. How horrible is that? How horrible is that, that the evil racist slave owner, Jefferson Davis, took in, adopted this kid and... The, the Union Army took him away. Nobody knows where he disappeared to. Um, 1848, right? How, how awful is it that Ralph Waldo Emerson insisted that, he was an abolitionist, insisted that slavery should end so that Black people could die off like the dodo bird? 
That was why he wanted slavery to end. Slavery was artificially perpetuating the existence of black people. That, that was Emerson's view. Uh, John Dix, Senator John Dix, Fort Dix is named after him. He became a Union general during the war. 1848, gets up on the floor of the U.S. Senate and says, we have to end slavery because it's artificially prolonging the life of the black race. We need to just end slavery and deport them all to Africa so they can go die off. Deport Jefferson Davis, yeah. Jefferson just, Davis gets up and, and says, what, what are you, I'm paraphrasing here, what the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> these people are human beings. I've grown up with these people. I love, so you, you have the, the racist abolitionist denying the humanity of black people and you have the slave owner, Jeff Davis, stating, de demanding that Dix recognize the humanity of black people. And, and you, you know, people go back and forth, oh, he was just trying to protect his investment, whatever. He's, he gets up on the floor of the U.S. Senate and says, these people are people. And we have a responsibility to treat them as people because they wouldn't be here if it weren't for us. They're part of our civilization. They're part of our society. We have a responsibility not to just ship them off to die. I'd say that's a pretty sound argument. Whether he was making it for selfish reasons or not, he made that argument on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent. No. <laughs> um, so going, going back to if you misunderstand the war, you misunderstand a whole host of things. And one of the things I want to point out to people is that nullification, and I think I got into this in the piece you were kind enough to publish on your blog. Um, and I, I also brought this up. I wrote a piece for the Abbeville Institute called Was Secession Treason? And one of the things I pointed out is that the people who first proposed secession from the United States were New Englanders, Oliver Ellsworth and Rufus King. 1794, they are both senators. They approach John Taylor of Caroline, who is then senator from Virginia, and they say, hey, this union isn't working out. We want to leave. Taylor writes to Jefferson, and Jefferson basically says, no, I don't want New England to leave because everybody hates them, and if they leave, then we'll just start fighting each other. <laughs> and Taylor's like, yeah, but New England really sucks. We um, really hate them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've been par paraphrasing, right? But yeah, Jefferson wrote it in, in far more eloquent oh. Term, no, I've seen but, it inscribed yeah. somewhere for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the um, <Indian> really right. <laughs> sucks. <laughs> well, and that, that was, and, and Taylor's view was they, they're so bad and they're taking so much control of the federal government. We let them go, let them go. They're perverting right. the constitution from day one. Right. But the, the idea of nullification and secession and the, the idea that this was just, um, I remember when I was in, in uh, I think it was constitutional law 101, right? Undergraduate school. And my professor gets up there and says, uh, nullification was just this idea dreamed up by John C. Calhoun to protect slavery. Well, that's just not true. Right. It's just not true. Um, number one, it goes back, though, there's, there's, your, there's your puppy. Yeah. Um, it goes back <laughs> at least as far as 1765 in the American colonies. Jefferson advocated it. Madison advocated it. Now, Madison in later life kind of went wonky and said, well, it, I mean, nullification, yes, but it's only a protest and there's no teeth to it and Calhoun's wrong. Well, no, Calhoun was right. Calhoun was carrying on the Jeffersonian position and Madison was betraying it. That's, that's the horrible um, tragedy of, of Madison is that he flip-flopped all over the place. But what people need to understand is that the idea of the federal government as limited, the federal government as strictly limited, the states as sovereign, was not just a Southern thing. And you can go back through, go back to the ratification, uh, the state ratification conventions and the debates they had there and read the proponents of the constitution, swear up one side and down the other that the, the constitution is not going to destroy the states, that it will respect the rights and liberties of the states. Um, and people just have this weird idea that that's, uh, you, the, the South came up with that to protect slavery. Well, no, here's Fisher Ames, uh, Fisher Ames representative in the Massachusetts ratification convention. He said, quote, the state governments represent the wishes and feelings and local interests of the people. They are the safeguard and ornament of the constitution. They will protract the period of our liberties. They will afford a shelter against the abuse of power and they will be the natural avengers of our violated rights. So Fisher Ames, Massachusetts, arguing to the ratification convention, hey, 
If the federal government gets out of line, the states will keep it in its cage. The states will force the federal government to obey the Constitution. That's not some Southerner. That's not some slave owner that's taken a break from whipping his slaves. That's not the, the Leonardo DiCaprio meme, right, from, from Django Unchained. That's Fisher Ames. That's a Massachusetts Puritan. Now, how he defined liberties and how each of the states defined liberties, that was different. And... Um, each, each, if you look at the proponents of the Constitution and in, in each ratification uh, debate, each ratification convention, they define liberty differently. They define what they want the state governments to be able to do differently. And that's because they had different cultures. And those different cultures go back to England. Um, Dr. Mel Bradford gets into this in uh, Original Intentions on the Making and Ratification of the United States Constitution. And he gets into those differences in how they define liberty, uh, the different ways they defined it. Um, the cultural differences. David Hackett Fisher goes into those cultural differences in uh, Albion's Seed. Um, but what we should recognize more than anything else is that there was a core uh, theme that all of the state ratification conventions agreed on. When the proponents went to the ratification conventions and said, hey, here's why you should ratify the, the, the Constitution, they were all making similar arguments when it came to federalism. When it came to localism, your government, you, you control your local community and the federal government does some stuff that has to do with foreign affairs and keeping the states from going to war with each other over, in, you know, tariffs, basically, right? You want to establish a free trade zone between the states so that you don't have Maryland and Virginia declaring war on each other like they did in the 1650s. Um, and otherwise, you, you control your local government. If you want to have an established church, you can. If you don't, that's fine. But federalism was the key. It was the key component of the whole thing. And Brian McClanahan gets into that in the Founding Fathers Guide to the Constitution, um, which is not, a, it's not academically written at all. It's not dry. It's, it's very readable. Um, Kevin R.C. Goodsman gets into that in the Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. Uh, Hamilton's Curse, Thomas DiDorenzo, How Alexander Hamilton Screwed Up America by Brian McClanahan. These are all great introductory sources because these Number one, these, these professors, these scholars write very well. They don't write, uh, you know, you've, you, you've, you've got this idea in your head, oh, it's going to be this, this tome that nobody can understand. No, it's very readable. It's very understandable, very accessible. Um, and they have a ton of references and a ton of resources. So if you want to go back and find out where they're getting their information from and fact check them, you can. Um, if you're looking for an older source on this, look up John Taylor of Caroline, look at his new views of the Constitution of the United States. Now, they were new views because in 1836, he was publishing this book after some new primary source documents had come out that were not available uh, prior to that. So they're, they're new views because he's got some new primary source evidence. He's saying, hey, we've got these new journals. We've got these new documents. I, I think it was... Um, it wasn't Madison's. Madison hadn't passed away yet, and his his convention journal or convention notes were, weren't uh, accessible to the public. I forget exactly. I, I think uh, Yancey and somebody else. I can't remember off the top of my head, but basically you've got a few people whose journals and notes from the convention were coming out, and Taylor was comparing that to arguments that were being made over the Constitution at the time, and he says, well, let's go back and look at what they said. Oh, look, federalism. Oh, look, limited federal government. So there's this meme that goes around the internet. Um, oh, the South seceded to protect states' rights. Well, a state's right to do what? Oh, to own slaves. Ah, no, no. States' rights had to do with, could a state leave the union? Number one, that's, that's why all the blood was shed, right? But number two, does a state control its own domestic institutions or not? Do you control your own domestic institutions or does Congress, does the federal judiciary? And as Thomas Jefferson pointed out over and over and over again in his letters, if the federal judiciary is the final arbiter of all laws, we don't have a Republican system. We have an oligarchy. We have an oligarchy that, that passes our laws or fails them. And as John Taylor points out in New Views of the Constitution of the United States, um, the Constitution requires that every state in the union have a Republican government, small r, and it guarantees that every state in the union will have a Republican government. But who ever heard of a republic whose laws could be overturned by some external tribunal? 
So if the Supreme Court can come in and strike down your state laws that your legislature passed after you elected them, right, assuming that there's not some kind of fraud going on, things are functioning as they should. If the Supreme Court can just come in and overturn that, do you even have a republic anymore? No, it's an oligarchy, and it's a violation of the Constitution. Um, as Jefferson pointed out in, I think it was his letter to William Charles Jarvis, I think he's, uh, I think that was who he was writing to. He says uh, that the Supreme Court is the, uh, it's the core of sappers and miners undermining our confederated fabric. Uh, 1819, he writes to Spencer Roan and says, under this understanding, judicial review, our constitution is a mere thing of wax that the Supreme Court can shape and mold into any form that it pleases. Uh, I forget exactly, there, there was one other letter where he writes and says, says to this guy, you're, un, you, you're saying that the judges can just interpret the constitution and they're the final arbiters. That's a very dangerous doctrine. We will be placed under the control of an oligarchy. Jefferson used that word in his own letters. And I quote, I quote all of those letters in that article that you were kind enough to publish. I just can't remember all the sources off the top of my head. Um, yeah, you had a lot of sources. You're very uh, well sourced. Yeah, and I'll link to that in the show notes. But thank you. You know, th this is the point I try to make. I try to like pull people back from the emotion and say it is what they stood for outside of slavery, right? Slavery is an excuse. I yes. honestly think the people that talk about it don't care. You know, because who do they want to enslave? This is what I was telling John Harris the other day. Free men. Me yeah. and you, right? My kids. So slavery is all the rage these days, right? Right. Some people have rights and other people don't. Slavery but, by any other name. Yeah. But if you're going to, right, take down Lee and Calhoun, well, of course, that's going to lead to Jefferson, you know, right. the Jeffersonian vision, the limited government, the states' rights vision. Um, and here are some things that you share with me. I won't say who this guy is, but this guy calls himself what? Like a ANCAP guy. He's a reformed pretty much. Yeah, he's, he's 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 an he's an anarcho capitalist. He you know oh the what was it the the biblical morality of enlightened uh, self interest or something like that. Like yeah. he's he's an he's he's trying to put a Jesus gloss on Ayn Rand. Yeah, it is absurd to have statues dedicated to a defeated army who fought in a moral cause. Well right is the cause of decentralization immoral is the cause of empire moral absolutely not robert e lee was personally anti-slavery but fought a war for the pro-choice side and then he did like clown faces and all this kind of yeah. stuff i mean it's lunacy uh I mean, of course it, of course it's lunacy but it's it's all emotionalism number one yeah and number two when people object to decentralization they say okay segregation if, if we decentralize and there's, uh, you know, the states can do what they want, what happens? You know, what happens to civil rights? Well, number one, the states have constitutions too. Mm -hmm. you, you might want to look into them. Right. Right. Because I, I have said in my own papers, other than Article 1, Section 10 or some subsequent amendments, the states can do as they please. Well, that's as far as the federal constitution goes. The states right. are limited by their own constitutions. Number two, your government is as bad as you let it be. So if right. you are dedicated to the preservation of liberty, again, as Brian McClanahan says, think locally, act locally. If you're dedicated to the preservation of liberty in your own backyard, your state is not going to become some evil segregationist Nazi hellhole or some communist red you know, utopia, dictatorship of the proletariat. If you're paying attention to what's going on in your own backyard and you're looking after yourself and your family and your neighbors, that's not going to happen. That's the whole point of decentralization. And segregation, people get this whole thing twisted up. Segregation was on its way out in the states already. There were already cases going through the state courts. Would it have been slower than having it taken down to the federal government? Probably, but it would have, would have been much more organic and it wouldn't have served the purpose of expanding federal power at the expense of the constitution. And but, I think organic is such a key word when things are forced and they become inauthentic right. and fake um we but c.s lewis c.s lewis in uh it was either mere christianity or the abolition of man he talks about the Tao, right and it's this idea that all over the course of history all these different civilizations have had a similar sense of morality hey murder is bad hey courage is a virtue 
you can have one wife or however many wives, but you can't just run around having any woman you please, right? To, to quote Lewis. And one of the things he points out is that there's the, the every, every civilization has understood that there are certain ideas that are right or wrong. Right. There's there is there is no civilization in the history of humanity where cowardice was a virtue. Right. But then he talks about the modern left and how they want to tear down Western civilization, which is built on this idea that he calls the Tao. And uh, all right, let's see if she stops. (laughs) Dogs are fun. I know. Hold on. Let me shut the door. Give me a second. I hope I'm not going on too many tangents. Talk about organic, man. That was real. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope I'm not off on too many tangents. I'm sorry. No. Um, but there's there's so many going. interconnected things that get into this. So well, I was gonna say I like put it trying to put people on putting them on the defensive, you know. Oh, you know, segregation wouldn't have been around for right. oh, you know, slavery was on its way out, you know. Oh, what you know defend immediate emancipation it, it was not nice to black or white <laughs> well, see, defend that's, that's the... the war defend integration by force defend the fact that i don't have any civil rights anymore defend that you know? well, and I, i've i've tried to get into that with people and and explain hey you know when when southerners pointed out that immediate emancipation wasn't going to work it wasn't just this an excuse to keep their slave property yeah massachusetts it was act- did do that they they did it slowly well here's the thing you're talking about transforming an entire economy and dealing with the emancipation education and integration or colonization of millions of people millions of people most of whom don't know how to read or write or do math they've never had to do a budget they've never had to worry about having a roof over their heads and i understand there were there were abuses in the system. There were abusive masters. I'm not denying that. But if the system was working as it was supposed to work under the law, no, they weren't free, but their, their health care was met. They had their food. They had their house. They had their clothes. They didn't have to worry about any of those things. So teaching them how to read and write and do math, how to integrate them into society, how to come up with enough capital to be able to afford to free them and then also pay them mm-hmm. to work. That's a big deal. Yeah. Because so much Southern money was tied up in the slaves. And again, that's a horrible, you know, we hear that today and we think, oh my God, that this, this disgusting, but that's, that's just how it was. Okay. I forget. I think it was Frank Owsley who said the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Right. We have to remember that to be able to look at, no, obviously this situation where you've got people that have chattel slaves and they don't know how to free them, obviously that's not a good situation, right? Nobody's saying that's a good situation. But you literally have late 1864 Hampton Roads Conference, Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, meets with Lincoln. And they're discussing this stuff going back and forth. And Lincoln says, look, you can come back into the Union. You can defeat the 13th Amendment. All you have to do is in the war, come back and pay your taxes. You can defeat slavery. You can, or excuse me, you can defeat emancipation. You can defend slavery. You can protect slavery. You can keep it till 1900 if you want. Just come back in the union and pay your taxes. Or we're going to free them. And, you know, that's that's not going to go the way you want it to. And Stevens basically says, okay, but if we free them, what happens next? Like what provision are you making for their education, their housing, their clothing, their food? their integration into society or colonization elsewhere. And Lincoln says, let them root hog or die. Mm-hmm. So free, freedom to starve is no freedom. And when, when Jeff Davis got up on the floor of the Senate in 1848 and said, hey, I have a responsibility to these people. They wouldn't be here if it weren't for my ancestors. They wouldn't, I, they're, they're in my care. Right? It's, it's a paternalistic attitude. And people condemn that, say, oh, this was just a white supremacist thing. I don't buy that. No. I don't buy that it was just this white supremacist thing. I think it ha- a lot of it had to do, you had decent people looking at, this, uh, looking at this, this massive group of slaves saying, yeah, okay, they've 
they don't know how to they don't know how to read they don't know how to write they don't know how to fend for themselves they need to be educated they need to be taught how this is why when robert e lee inherited well his wife inherited her father's slaves and robert e lee was made the executor of that will under the terms of the will all of those slaves were supposed to be freed within the first five years after uh, the death of Mrs. Lee's father, George Washington Park Custis. And uh, in order to make the estate solvent, Lee made the slaves work. And they complained because for many years prior to that, Custis hadn't made them work. And Lee's take on this is, look, I've got to come up with the money to be able to meet the obligations of the estate and free you. But one of the things, and, and he wound up pouring, I think he spent twenty dollars or $30,000 of his own money making the estate solvent in time to meet the terms of the will. Every single one of those slaves was free by December of 1862. So keep in mind, Lee, commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, Confederate general, as he's dealing with all this stuff fighting the war, he's also still acting as executor of his, his father-in-law's will to free those slaves. He didn't just stop doing that because he was busy with the war. Um, but as, as under the terms of the will, a school in violation of state law, a school was set up at Arlington to educate the slaves and prepare them for freedom so that they wouldn't just be thrust out into society to be taken advantage of by any con man on the street. They know how to read. They know how to write. They know how to do math. They know how to balance a budget. They know, hey, you've got to factor in all these costs to be able to live. You know, things that people teach their kids that, that adults now take for granted. These folks had never learned that. And it wasn't because that they were somehow inferior genetically, but they'd, nev they'd never been taught any of this stuff. This, they had to learn how to do this. Um, and, and Lee also made sure that before any of the slaves were freed, he lined up a place for them to, to go. He lined up paying work of some sort for them if he could find it. Um, they, they could work somewhere else for somebody when he could find skilled trades for them to be apprenticed in. He, hey, we're this this guy's going to be free do you want to take him on as an apprentice and any slaves that were not uh you know well that they were too old to work they were going to be taken care of they were going to be freed and then taken care of out of the funds of the estate so these are humane men who inherited a system that yeah it was bad lee declared it to be bad davis later declared it to be bad um, according to Davis in the 1840s or 50s, you can read, go read his private letters. He said slavery was a dying institution in the 1850s. It was economically unviable in the 1850s, and he knew it. It wasn't a matter of perpetuating slavery. It was a matter of, hey, you Northerners freed your slaves your own way. At no, you didn't destroy your economy. Nobody threatened you with domestic terrorism. John Brown didn't try to kill all of you in your sleep, right? And we weren't funding John Brown, right? One of, one of, the, one of the big problems in many of the state uh, secession ordinances where they declare their reasons for seceding, the fact that Republican governors had refused to extradite people that had funded John Brown's terrorist raid, that was, that was a big thing. Um, hey, you guys, you guys funded this terrorist that wanted to kill us all. You guys funded this terrorist that wanted to kill us all and then refused to extradite these people for trial. Right. John Brown was hailed as, as you know, this, this Jesus-like figure. So the South's looking at this going, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Is this actually about you caring about the slaves or is this about you hating us and wanting money and power? And right? that's, that's and I, th I think I th it, it's kind of like this. Um, imagine for a minute that Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping declare war on the United States, right? And then a year into the war, there's all this bloodshed, invasion, people dying all over the place. And let's say, uh, you know, Joe Schmo joined up, Mr. Mr. Pro-Life Joe, Joe Schmo joined up to defend the country. And then a year into the war, uh, Putin or Xi Jinping or whoever it is, says, oh, hey, by the way, uh, we invaded your country to end abortion. Are you going to believe the guy? <laughs> it, uh, I think it was J.P. Morgan who said that every man has two reasons for the things he does, a good reason and the real one. Right. right? The, the government's exactly the government's the same way. Karl Marx pointed out, Karl, Karl Marx, 
who wrote Lincoln a congratulatory red letter that said, hey, uh, you know, congrats on being reelected 1864. Karl Marx wrote, uh, and Engels both, the war wasn't about slavery. It was about power and control. Right. Uh, Charles Dickens, December of 1862, the idea that the war is about slavery is a piece of specious humbug to conceal northern uh, greed. So this, this, these people that get on online and, oh, you know, Robert E. Lee was, was personally, uh, you know, anti-slavery, but pro he fought for the pro-choice side. Number one, there's no moral equivalent to be made between abortion and slavery. There's just no equivalent there. Because if you have a decent man, you could be a decent man and inherit slaves and not know how to free them and still be a decent person. You, there's no way to, to murder a baby and dismember it and sell its body parts and still be a decent person. There, there's, no way, there's no way you can do that and still ha have any kind of a Christian ethic. Right. So, so if, if you're, Je if you're Jefferson Davis and you have slaves and you live in a, in a society that has slaves, well, it's going to die out. I don't know how it's going to die out. I don't know when it's going to die out. I don't know how I'm going to free these slaves and look after them and make sure that they can make it on their own. Oh, and on top of it, we have, you know, uh, widows and orphans and men coming back from a war that, the federal government subsidized well, and, and that's, pushed and upon that, them and they're missing limbs and they're all shell-shocked and crazy and they come back and their houses are gone that too that was also um well that's something that's something pe <laughs> people not a good thing that, people insist that the the average southern soldier was fighting to defend slavery okay the most the vast majority of people in the south didn't own slaves number one number two one-fourth of the Southern fighting men died. And another fourth were, were maimed or wounded. That's a 50% casualty rate. You're telling me that these guys signed up, got themselves shot, blown apart, limbs torn off, died of disease or exposure to the elements. Half of them didn't come back or came back maimed for life. So that Ashley Wilkes could own slaves? Right. And That's meanwhile, an absurd. yeah. And meanwhile, you know, women are back running the, the homes, the plantations, you know, most people who own slaves, which like you said, was not very many Southerners per the population, one or two, right? I mean, most slaves did not run away during that time when these properties are being managed by women, children, and elderly people. Um, I think that's a, a fascinating way to look at it too. And Again, you know what else they didn't do? They didn't pull a John Brown and rise up and murder children in their sleep. They didn't pull a Nat Turner and rise up and murder, murder innocent people. And, and the idea, oh, well, there were no innocent people. They were all part of this. That's absurd. And I, I had, uh, I remember talking this over with a professor of mine once, and I brought up the fact that Sherman wrote to Union Secretary, William Tecumseh Sherman writes to Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton during the invasion of Georgia and says, hey, there's an entire class of people here in Georgia that we have to exterminate men, women, and children. And I pointed that out to my professor, and she said, oh, well, he, he was just talking about the, you know, the master class, the big slave owners. And I said, men, women, and children. Children. Exterminate children. Why? And, Sh and Sherman made it very clear. He didn't care about the slaves. He said this over and over again in his private letters to his wife, in his private letters to his brother, and in his official military reports. He said this over and over again in the most racist terms possible, and I'm not going to quote them. He didn't care about the slaves at all. It was all about punishing treason, by which he meant standing up to the U.S. government that was violating the U.S. Constitution. That was it. Obey the government or die. Obey the government or my army will come through and steal your jewelry, rip your earrings out of your ears, brutalize you, burn your house, sow your fields with salt, dig up your dead and steal their gold fillings and jewelry, and gang rape you before we leave. And the dehumanization of the Southern man, the archetype, as I say, oh, yeah. the, the, the white Southern conservative Christian man, um, is necessary to do exactly what you said, you know, so the empire can do whatever it wants to you. And it is 
the same old story. Um, <laughs> it's nothing new. And uh, you wrote a four part Lee series for Abbeville talking about um, Lee deep dives, the believer, the father, the soldier and the educator. I wanted to get into that, but we've been talking quite a while and I heard my kids get home from baseball Ooh, practice sorry about and that. I'm sure they're hungry. No, it's awesome, but I'm going to link to those. But um, it is, it's the same old thing. There's nothing new under the sun. So um, well, of course, tell yeah. us with, with the last few minutes we're talking, you know, it gets really hard out there. You know, you get um, totally blackpilled about what's going on. Now we know that God will, he is in control. Yes. You know, we need to put this all at the foot of the cross and do all we can do, but what can we do besides prayer and really not letting this world take us over? Um, sign your petition. petition. What else pragmatically can Southerners and their allies do to rise above this build better communities and um, resist the empire? That's a deep question. And you want me to wrap it up in five minutes. Um, <laughs> five minutes. Sign the petition. And then sign the, well, sign the petition. Be, in, be involved in your local community. Um, I know get I married. sound like a broke, get, get married and have get married kids, and have yeah. babies, right? Cause you, uh, you're and raise the, raise them, yeah. raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Yeah. Right. Um, don't, don't let them get you down. I know that's, that's a cliche, but there is a God in heaven, right? There's a devil in hell. There's a God in heaven. Mm -hmm. Um, and that just, that just made me think of Milton, uh, book four, John Milton's paradise lost book four lines 393 394 and then the fiend uh with necessity the tyrant's plea excused his devilish deeds right that's what the government always tries to do oh it's a necessity um well you need to have lots of babies because you have a photographic memory it's blowing not my really mind. no 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 <laughs> i'm like no, who it's... did i talk to yesterday like i don't even know my kids I... i'll call them the wrong names whatever you know i forget a lot more than i remember believe me um i i remember a lot less than i should it's very impressive uh, though. Well, you know a lot. Yeah, it's hard to cram it all in there. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, you know, one of the you you brought up those pieces on Lee. And one of the things that I learned when researching those pieces, in 1868, he was sitting and talking to Wade Hampton. And Wade Hampton asked him, he said, Hey, you know, the war it's, we're all blown up. Like the people, would you do anything differently? All the suffering, all the death, all the loss, would you do anything differently? Would, would you would you side with the North, right? Because that was something Lee could have done. Lincoln offered him the command of the Union Army. And Lee, of course, turned it down to defend his home. And Hampton asks him, would you, you know, no, looking back, knowing what you know, would you, would, you, would you go the other way? And Lee said, I could have taken no other course without dishonor. And if I had to do it all over again, I would act in precisely the same manner. And the reason he said that is because he understood something that uh, Reverend R.L. Dabney wrote in 1890. Only the atheist judges success as the criterion of right. And obviously we do this, we, we get involved in our local communities, we meet our neighbors, we, we get close to our neighbors, we take care of our own backyard, we get married and we have babies and we raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. We do all of those things and, and, and we fight, the, we, we sign the petitions, we stand up against the tyranny, we fight the good fight, and we do that because we want to win, yes. But for the Christian, there is, there's an even deeper purpose. The Westminster Catechism asks, what, the, the very first question it asks, what is the chief end of man? And every good little reformed child knows the answer. And my father was a devout Presbyterian. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So when Lee says, yeah, I'd go, I'd, I'd do it all the same. When, when Daphne says only the atheist judges success of the criterion of right, he's not, well, he is kind of insulting atheists, but that's not his purpose. His purpose is to say, we as Christians know that there is a deeper purpose than success. Right. Doing the right thing is the right thing to do. And even if you fail on this earth, you still have an obligation to do the right thing. And 
we should lay up our treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Um, somebody said the other day, you know, Jake, I think we're in the end times. I think, I think this is the end. Uh, you know, we're, we're headed into the mark of the beast. And I said, okay, that doesn't relieve me of my responsibility to do my duty. That doesn't mean I, I stop fighting tyrants. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something we should all remember is yes, yes, it, it, it matters. Our homes matter. Our families matter. Our communities matter. We love them. We, we are fighting this fight to protect them and we want to win. But you know what? Even if we don't win, there is a God in heaven and he sees. Oh. And, and when, we, when you when I die and I stand before the throne of grace, I want him to look at me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that means not giving up, even, even in the darkest of times. And C.S. Lewis encapsulated this perfectly in his novel, The Last Battle, which is the last of the Narnia, Narnia novels. You may have read this with your kids. Um, the world ends and the last king of Narnia who's been fighting against all, you know, the, the last king of Narnia has been fighting against all the, the odds, every, everything's gone wrong. And then suddenly he winds up in heaven and Aslan, who is the Jesus analogy in, in Narnia, says, welcome last of the kings of Narnia who stood firm even in the darkest hour. And that's the takeaway. Yes, absolutely. I'm not doing this because I want to be a martyr. Trust me, I want to win. I want to get married and have kids and settle down with my wife and have the white picket fence and raise the babies, <laughs> right? But if, if, they, if, the, if the deep state assassinates me tomorrow, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Mm -hmm. to, li to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I would rather fear God than man. And I would rather obey God than man. And defiance to tyrants is obedience to God. As John Knox said, and as Thomas Jefferson appropriated, defiance to tyrants is obedience to god and uh i have a a lee coaster here oh nice <laughs> you can't read it anymore but it's his quote where it says uh duty is the sublimest word in the english language you should do your duty in all things you can never do more you should never do less i that i have is, some i have some heartbreaking what you were saying but i have some heartbreaking news for you what uh and if you looked at the footnotes in my piece, you would have realized this, uh, that that's a fake quote. Is it really? Um, it, it was manufactured from several pieces. Uh, you, you know how Union soldiers took over Arlington, mm -hmm. right? Well, apparently some of them decided it would be funny to write up this fake letter that Lee wrote to his son and make it seem real preachy. You know, we're going to make fun of this guy by making it look like he's real preachy in his letter to his son. Why that was the greatest prank they could come up with, I don't know. But apparently th you know, there were a bunch of them uh, sitting around in Arlington going through the desks or whatever, and they find bits and pieces of letters. And then they, uh, they write up this fake letter where they use bits and pieces of info uh, from the letters and then include themes from like these New England primers and stories about this old New England clergyman and all this stuff. Um, but Custis denied that the, that the letter was supposedly addressed to Lee's eldest son, uh, Custis Lee. Custis denied the letter's authenticity. There are a number of um, uh, details that are wrong that Lee would not have gotten wrong. Like he said, oh, uh, he says something about going to see off, going off to see his old regiment. Well, it's the wrong regiment. That regiment didn't exist at that point in time. Just all these different pieces uh, that, that are just in, inaccurate and incorrect. But, but... Um, and, and there's there's actually a footnote. Is that it's, in it's the in, father one? It's in essay number four. And the no 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 no. It's it's, it's essay two. It's essay two. The it's father. it's the one about Lee the father. Um, but if you, I, I think I just I I uh, I bring that up at the end of a paragraph. I say, alas, the the letter about duty to Custos is false or something like that. But if you go and look at the footnote, there's actually this whole whole uh, uh, address uh, that was written down and presented. Um, I think it was 1904, but it, it's, it's the Lee family archive and they've digitized this address. And this, this, this guy who's giving this address is, is talking to a society of people who are interested in Lee. And he says, look, this thing is fake. I know it's fake. I've talked to Custis. I've gone through the archives. I've done that. And he gives peace, you know, all this evidence. It's, it's a, it's a huge document. Um, but he says, but, but we can take uh, we can take uh, uh, solace in the fact 
that Lee did believe in duty. Um, and even though he didn't say it exactly that way, he certainly, it, it encapsulates the sentiment. It encapsulates the, the man's ideals. Um, and according to, the, according to Lee's best biographer, Douglas Southall Freeman, if you had to sum up Lee, if you had to explain it to people in one story, you, you could tell them this, this one right here. When Lee was uh, elderly, this is after, after the war, 1870, he knows he's about to pass away. He goes and pays a visit to some friends in Northern Virginia so that he can say goodbye. And uh, a woman walks up to him with her baby, her newborn baby, and hands him to Lee and says, you know, what, what should I teach my son so that he can succeed in life? What, what should I teach my son so that he'll be a good man? And Lee looks at the little boy and then looks at her and looks back to the baby and says, teach him he must deny himself. Yep. And that's, that's the measure of the man right there. Well, Earl, it has been awesome talking to you. I could keep Thank talking you. I to you. appreciate you having me. Yeah, and I need to read your uh, four-part series again more closely. I missed that the first time around. And I'm so sad about my, uh, my coaster here. Well, but you know, you could see that the um, the writing's coming off of it anyway. So now it's just got a picture of Lee. And that's, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a doozy. I mean, you know, even people who uh, don't know much about Lee know that quote. That's fascinating. Well, and see, I always thought that quote was genuine. And I was sitting there trying to write that up. And I said, I want to find the letter this is from. And I'm sitting there, you know, flipping through every primary source collection I've got. I'm like, this, this is, I can't find it. Maybe it's digitized. Yeah. And then I, I find that and go, oh, no. But even though Lee didn't say it, it is true to the man. Yeah. It yeah. is absolutely an encapsulation of Lee's character. So. Well, and that also proves that you are uh, quite the historian. So, um, well, I, I got lucky. Awesome. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a pedant when it, I'm pedantic when on the yeah. details. And that's why uh, amateur history is so fun because it is uh, time consuming, but you get to go <laughs> down these awesome, fun rabbit holes and find out things that you, um, Sometimes you don't want to find out, but uh, other times you do. So it's fascinating. And it's all part of our story. So um, yeah, sure thank you, is. Earl. And I'm going thank to um, put all sorts of stuff in the show notes. Make sure to do the uh, I petitions. And again, that's called Tennessee Must Oppose Medical Tyranny. Keep yep. doing what you're doing. Stay tough. And um, make sure you stop and smell the roses, right? Thanks very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good all evening. Right. Bye-bye.